All right, we're live. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me for the next installment of my Wellness Wednesday series, which took a little summer hiatus and is now back for fall. Um, today, we're going to be talking about an issue that I feel like I should have addressed on my site, you know, when I first started it and started talking about healthy eating, and that's um, kind of the emotional side of the equation. Uh, so I know I personally don't have a perfect relationship with food just yet. I don't think really there's any woman who can claim to have a completely uncomplicated relationship with food. Um, so I have a great guest here with me today, Isabel Fox and Duke, who is the founder of Stop Fighting Food. And we're going to kind of talk about some of these issues around the diet binge cycle, um, what types of, you know, even when you're really healthy, maybe that doesn't mean you're emotionally healthy, and just general strategies to stop being crazy around food. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> yeah, welcome. Absolutely. Hi, thank you for having me. This is so exciting. Absolutely. So why don't we start off while you by you telling us a little bit about yourself, um, since not everyone watching may know all the fabulous work you've done. Yeah, so um, basically what I do, like you said, is I help women stop feeling a little crazy around food. You know, like food can be a little bit emotionally taxing, making choices around food. What's the right choice to make? You know, am I doing this correctly? Um, you know, obviously body image, as I mentioned off air, is a huge component of this, right? Like, how do I know, like, where am I making choices for my health versus where am I making choices for my, you know, because I want to control my body and what are the repercussions of that? How does that affect you know, everything I think about food and, you know, ultimately it can be a real, like, tailspin in women's minds. You know, like, food can take up a lot of our mental energy. You know, it's not, it's not easy for most people, um, which is unfortunate because you'd think, like, food is supposed to be this, like, natural, biological, instinctive thing, and because we live in, a, in kind of like a diet culture and, like, a food-obsessed culture, um, it, it kind of becomes, it can become a war for some women, right? Like it can become this like struggle, like what am I supposed to eat? What should I eat? Oh shit, I ate that thing, now I feel badly about myself. That's sort of the biggest one is like feeling guilt around food and shame around food and guilt and shame around our bodies. So this is really the broader uh, area that I talk about is like helping women sort of just develop more sanity and ease in their relationship with food, which ultimately has a lot of impacts on how women end up eating because when women are obsessed with food they often find themselves getting trapped in the diet binge cycle right like I'm really good one day and then I like I fell off the wagon I'm being really bad and you know I can't stop eating chocolate chip cookies you know so that's that's my that's my area amazing so these issues are so common I feel like sometimes we just chalk them up to some sort of normalcy do most of the women you work with know that they're crazy about food yeah, I mean, the women who come to me generally um, find my website and they think to themselves immediately, oh my gosh, I didn't know that other people felt this way. Like, I didn't know that other people were, like, in the kitchen eating, you know, crackers, like, standing up straight out of the cabinets hoping their husband didn't catch them. You know, like, there's a lot of this sort of, like, secretive, like, hiding behavior, lots of shame, lots of guilt around food, you know, particularly when we're not eating perfectly, which no one ever does or ever will, you know. Um, and, and what's interesting is, like, the shame and guilt sort of perpetuates and can create all of these even further negative and self-destructive behaviors. It's like, oh my gosh, I feel so guilty that I broke my diet or broke the way of eating that I'm supposed to eat. I ate this cookie. Now, like, screw it. You know, I call it like, fuck it eating. I'm going to eat the whole thing and then tomorrow I'll be good again. You know, and it's this cycle that women find themselves in. And, and most women feel really alone in that cycle. Like, they don't realize that this is something that huge numbers of women to some degree or another, you know, the vast majority of women, I would make the argument, are dealing with to some extent because there's so much pressure on women around food in our society. So, um, of course, it's going to kind of lead to this sort of like rebellious guilt, shame, I'm being good, I'm being bad, I fell off the wagon, I suck, oh my god, I had one brownie, I might as well have the whole tin of brownies and start again tomorrow. You know, that whole cycle is far more common than people think. So when people find me, they're usually like, oh my god, like I cannot believe somebody is saying this out loud. Like, they, it's... Um, people find a real comfort in it. So, yeah, so generally I guess the answer to your question is like most women do uh, have this, most women who work with me kind of have this sense of like, oh my god, she's like reading my mind, like how did she know? Um, but what they I don't realize like is... Everyone talks about eating disorders and no one talks about this gray area in between, which is, you know, that a lot of things could be happening off, up here that aren't really, well, but regardless of the shame and the hidden behaviors. Um, but some of the things might not be manifesting in a behavior that would fall into the category of like a textbook eating disorder, but it's still obviously disordered eating. 
Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that's the whole. That's one of my greatest criticisms of um, you know how sort of eating disorders are discussed in our culture. It's like it's not like you either have one or you don't. For the vast majority of people, like it's a spectrum, right? And we mm -hmm. usually define clinical eating disorders as you know when you get to the point where you're engaging in really physically self-harming behaviors, right? When you get to the point of like throwing up your food, when you get to the point of being so clinically underweight that like it's dangerous for your health, like when you get to the point of you know X, Y, or Z phys physical self harming behavior, that's when people start to define you as eating disordered. But in reality, there's a lot of shit that happens before that. You know, like there's a lot of just woo, like crazy frustration and just like difficulty with food that like so the vast majority of women are dealing with to some extent, right? Like just this feeling of like, I shouldn't have done that. Should I do this? You know, what should I try with food next? Like what should I, you know, what's the latest diet? Like this obsessing, right? Like this like okay. this craziness, this feeling of like my mind is consumed with thoughts of food and dieting and eating and not eating and you know, all that stuff way before you'd ever get to the point of being diagnosed with an eating disorder, you know? Totally. So, Actually yeah. that's one of my questions I have for you is about the talk, because I, I catch myself using like guilt oriented words about food sometimes myself and I remember when I first you know was diagnosed with a gluten allergy and had like was told by my doctor I have to stop if it if I'm gonna be able to manage my autoimmune disease yeah. I remember like in the beginning I didn't take it that seriously and I would sometimes like eat gluten and yeah. when I would do it I would say to my boyfriend like I'm gonna cheat tonight and he was like don't call it cheating like yeah. what are you cheating I mean you can't digest it so right you know, right some sort of diet here like you're cheating yourself if anything right but, um, I still catch myself using that kind of terminology around my allergy which is interesting right. because it's just kind of ingrained well it's so interesting that you say that because one of the biggest questions I get from women when we talk about you know basically giving up diets is well what if I have medical reason to not eat a certain food you know like how do I manage that and in my mind I'm like they're very different things like when you're giving up a specific food for a medical reason, theoretically, you know, if you do choose to break that rule in quotes or cheat in quotes, it's not like you're you're not you're just you're just choosing to do that to yourself. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you're just making that choice and it's just the choice you made. Like, okay, today it's worth it for me to have the cupcake and uh, I know I'm gonna be incurring physical repercussions of that, but say la vie. It doesn't affect my self esteem, right? Like I also actually don't eat gluten. Because Yay. of intest intestinal difficulties with gluten. <laughs> and like I always try to explain to people, like, if I were to eat gluten, it wouldn't make me feel like a bad person. You know, like I wouldn't feel like I've done something hugely wrong or like I'm so bad. I wouldn't take it on to be like, oh my god, I suck that I ate gluten. It would just be like, okay, now you have to go sit on the toilet. You know, like it's just like, you know, like it's just there's just it's just a simple, basic physical consequence to eating a certain way. It's not something that affects my self-esteem or like feeling of self-worth as a person, which is where a lot of women get really tripped up. Is that women who are accustomed to traditional diet culture, which is what our society is largely teaching women, you know, they get caught up in like basically giving certain foods morality, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's righteous to eat one way or another, which is, it's that righteousness, it's that morality around food that ultimately ends up creating this diet binge cycle, right? Like this, like, I screwed up today, I suck, like, I might as well go, like, stuff my face in, like, a box of whatever because, you know, I've blown it and whatever, you know? So, um... Yeah, so ultimately, like, making decisions for, for, like, medical reasons or for true health purposes should be thought about in a very different way than diet mentality and diet culture. Yeah. Has to, but but it's it's complex and it's not easy for people to make the switch because we're so bombarded with diet mentality all the time. So it's like hard to make that mental shift. Are there any like terms or phrases that you try and ban with your clients like cheating and things like that? Yeah, even something like should or shouldn't, you know, like even something as basic and fundamental as that. Like I'll always say like I can eat gluten, but the result of me eating gluten is that I will get sick. You know, like, that's it. Like, there's no morality around it, right? Like, there's no, like, I'm a bad person if I'm eat, I eat gluten. It's no, like, oh, my God, like, this is, like, the devil, and, like, I can't do this. It's just if I eat gluten, the consequences of me eating gluten are this. And, like, knowing that information, like, which do I choose? You know, like, it's just a choice. Like, ultimately, I could choose to eat the gluten, and that would be fine. I would just have to suffer the consequences of that, you know? Um, as opposed are, to, yeah. Like, now that there has just been this huge, like, avalanche of wellness 
information. And like obviously diet trends have existed since the dawn of time, but for some reason I feel like now it's just like an even more saturated market. Like how does that affect like this issue of morality? Do people just feel guilty all the time no matter what they eat? Is, have you well, noticed any changes? I mean health is the new religion. You know what I mean? Like as we're moving away, I mean depending on what part of the country and what part of the world you're in, right? Like you could make arguments either way, but like there's certainly a great, you know, population of people in the United States who are moving away from religion and health has become this new way of like asserting like who we are and our identity and like this is right and that is wrong and you know it's such an intensely personal thing yet like we definitely I think a lot of people really feel the need to like shout their um, you know like give people shoulds and shouldn'ts it's very it's, it, health can be very evangelical you know so <laughs> like, um, so you know health is is really it's it's rapidly growing as an obsession in our country that's beyond just I have a value of taking care of my body it's beyond that now right like it's turned into um, this is what's right and wrong, this is what other people should be doing, you know, like, if you're paleo versus vegan, it's like this, like, big, like, identity issue, um, and, like, you know, if you're paleo or if you're vegan, you, like, like strongly dislike the people on the other side, you know, and it's, it's just this, like, weird thing. So, um, yeah, the health thing in this country is getting blown up out of proportion. I also think, and this is my personal opinion, you know, when we, a lot of the obsession with health has revolved around the diet industry, the weight loss industry specifically, right? Like, I don't think if women weren't so obsessed with weight loss, I don't think the health industry, the for-profit health industry would be nearly as profitable or prevalent as it is. You know, most, a lot of people who are in the health world sort of get into the health world through this, like, weight loss lens. And, like, even if you look at, like, people like Mark Hyman and, you know, all these people who are, like, really smart, interesting doctors who they really just want to, like, help people, like, live a long, healthful, prosperous life, you'll see, like, the way they sell their products is all weight loss based because they know that's what sells. You know, like, people want to buy weight loss even more than they want to buy health. So there's this, like, intermingling between health and weight loss that um, is a little bit, I would say, a little bit damaging to, to our culture and the conversation that's going on. And that's been aggressively, exponentially growing since, you know, the 70s and 80s, but even before that. But definitely in the past 20 years, it's like the, the, the um, obsession with weight is getting more and more out of control. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so... Back to the emotional eating side of things. I want to hear like exactly what you mean by that um, because I watched your free training videos which are amazing and if you guys out there want some more information on all of these issues, you should definitely go check them out. Um, they're three and they're just great. Um, so one distinction that you make in one is that emotional eating is not always a bad thing. So I actually got, when I posted about this Wellness Wednesday, I got a comment on my Instagram photo that said, well, I just had a very emotional experience, like housing a chocolate donut, and it felt great. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah. you, that's like very positive emotions. <laughs> so. Totally. I mean, it's kind of like this conversation that we just had about gluten, you know, like emotional eating, if we look at it from a value-neutral, non-moralizing standpoint, Emotional eating is just like eating over feelings. It gives you temporary relief. It doesn't solve any emotional problems, right? So like using it over and over and over again and not solving your problems is probably not the best way to go. However, like it does give you like an immediate relief. It's like an immediate coping mechanism. It distracts you from what's going on. That's just what it is. It's just a coping mechanism, right? Like a coping mechanism could really span the gamut. And I've said this before in other interviews, like taking a warm bath is a coping mechanism and sorting heroin is a coping mechanism too. You know, like emotional eating falls somewhere in the middle, you know, <laughs> like it's, um, you know, coping mechanisms all have have just different consequences and different benefits, you know, and um, the consequence of emotional eating are, you know, kind of differ depending on, you know, what you're eating, obviously, and how often you're eating emotionally, but really, that's all it is. It's like, you just know that when you choose to eat something emotionally, like, you get to make the decision right then and there, like, is this worth it or not? You know, like, I would make the argument that, you know, having an occasional cupcake when I, like, feel like I want a little pick-me-up is really not the end of the world. In fact, that might be, like, a really, like, reasonable way for me to just like get a little like excitement that day like I'm gonna go have like a really beautiful French macaroon and I'm not hungry I certainly my body doesn't certainly need that sugar but like it's worth it like it's like having a cocktail or something like I'm gonna just enjoy it because that's my choice today um, so it's yeah it's certainly not always a bad thing you know it's just like it's I want women to feel empowered in their choices and feel like they can decide when it's appropriate to have a cupcake and when it's appropriate to have a cookie and just feel like good about their choices, feel like they're making informed aware decisions without this burden of, oh my god, I should, I shouldn't be, da 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 which ultimately just feeds our obsession with food and feeds our wanting to eat more and more of it, ironically. So how do you, like, what are your recommendations for someone becoming more aware of, like, where their food motivations come from? Like, the emotional side, the physical side. I feel like when you get too much in your head, you just get completely detached from that. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a balance because I've worked with women who become obsessive about like, oh my gosh, was I hungry? Did I need this? Was this emotional? You know, and that can be like its own, you know, kind of hell in and of itself. So I definitely try to encourage women for the most part to just like chill out, man. Like relax. Like it is just food. Like let's get real here. Like come on now. Um, on the other hand, like if you wanted to like really in a very non-judgmental, non-shaming way, which is really the key thing here is like can you look at your emotional eating from a non-judgmental, non-shaming lens? Um, then you can just like you can just you know kind of cultivate awareness and make choices with awareness. Like oh, like I notice that I'm wanting like a cupcake right now. I wonder why that is oh, okay, maybe it's because, like, I'm really bored at work and I don't really like my job, and, like, then I can make a decision. Well, is it worth it for me to eat the cupcake to, like, take the edge off of me being bored at work, or is it not? And, like, I can just make that decision with awareness rather than, oh, my God, I suck, I shouldn't have done this, blah, 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 which ultimately is what leads to binge eating, which I also distinguish from emotional eating, right? Like, binge eating is sort of what happens when we get caught up in that obsessive, shaming, you know, mentality of, like, one-track mind, food, 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 food versus emotional eating, which could just be pretty benign, you know? Like, having a cupcake when you're bored at work is not the end of the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, so back to the diet thing briefly, um, just to, like, touch on a couple of the trends, um, one of them being yeah. juicing. <laughs> what? Yes. I'm so curious to get your thoughts on juicing in general and, you know, what it does for women, both emotionally and physically, um, and I guess what it represents, which is essentially just not eating for three days. Yeah, well, so, like, in general, I'm not a big fan of, like, forced calorie, de you know, deprivation. Like, I think that that almost always backfires for most women, right? Like, there are a few handful of women who can, like, somehow, like, muster up being able to, like, deprive themselves without having some sort of, like, rebellious reaction or without becoming obsessed with food. But the vast majority of people incur negative psychological and physical consequences from extreme calorie deprivation. That being said, ultimately, what's... Um, I mean, I'll just, there's, God, there's so much I could say on this topic, but I'll just say really quickly, like, juicing, like, I drink juices with meals, you know, like, I drink a green juice with my, like, you know, egg sandwich, you know, like, that's, that's how I roll, like, juices are great, they're, like, condensed nutrients, you know, you're fitting, like, eight vegetables in, like, a tiny glass that your stomach can hold really easily, like, that's awesome, like, I love juicing, like, I'm a, like, I am, like, a juice press club member, but I don't fast, you know, like I drink juice because like I want the nutrients and I want the, you know, all of the benefits that those juices give me. I don't need to only drink juice in order to get the benefits of juice. So I'll just say that right up front. Um, as far as emotionally, you know, like I always say like women are far more addicted to dieting than they are to eating, right? Like when people say like I'm like addicted to food, like generally speaking people are actually, what they're actually addicted to is dieting and then of course when we diet we get triggered into this rebellious emotional eating, binge eating cycle. So it feels like we're addicted to food but really what we're addicted to is restricting. And a cleanse is like the ultimate of seductive, sexy restriction. It's like, so oh my god. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to go on a cleanse, I'm just going to, like, do this thing for three days, and then, like, everything that's wrong in my life will be better. You know, like, in three days, like, everything will be fine, like, my, my boyfriend will propose to me, I'll get a promotion, three days of juice cleansing fixes everything. There ain't nothing three days of juice cleansing can't fix. You know, like, that's sort of the mentality that women fall into. Um, with diets in general, but juice cleansing is particularly seductive because it's this like really fast, intense thing that we think is going to like change our life in 72 hours. Um, <laughs> and I feel like it's an excuse for women not to eat because it's become like so commonplace to go on a juice cleanse. You're like, I can't, I'm on a juice cleanse. It's like right. a nice little scapegoat. A hundred percent. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, that's really like what it is. It's, I mean, and then that, that, that goes into the whole conversation with this sort of like co-mingling of health and weight loss or like being like, oh, oh, I'm not like obsessed with being like, you know, trying to control my body for the purpose of like getting more people to like me. I just want to be healthy. <laughs> like, you know, like it's a rationalization. It's, it's, it's for many women, it's bullshit. Um, so, and a juice cleanse is like a perfect example of that. It's like a socially acceptable way to starve yourself. <laughs> um, Totally. Is there a word, I feel like maybe I read it somewhere, you told me at some point in the past, like, is there a word for this type of um, like health obsession as an eating disorder? Yes, it's called orthorexia, um, which is a clinical eating disorder term. I don't know how it's defined. I mean, I'm sure, I am not a clinical therapist, so like, first of all, I'm just going to say that right now. I am not treating eating disorders. I am not like... I am by no means a clinical therapist in eating disorders. I have my, you know, my, my private opinion, or not so private, my opinions, but... Um, 
this is all to be taken just as like information in my opinion. I'm just going to say that. So on that note, I don't know how clinical therapists are diagnosing orthorexia. Um, I'm sure, you know, when people go into a clinical therapist's office, they're incentivized to give people diagnoses of some kind for health insurance reasons. So like if you come in and like, you know, something that you're struggling with is like thinking about, you know, making healthful foods or primarily feeling guilt and shame when you don't make healthful choices, right? So like when I eat the cookie or the whatever I deem to be unhealthy, I feel awful about myself and it affects my self-esteem. That's, I'm assuming, how that would be diagnosed. Um, but, but yeah, but I mean that happens to people all the time who aren't being diagnosed as orthorexia, right? Like it goes, it goes back to our old, um, to our original conversation, which is like a lot of women feel guilty when they make quote unquote unhealthy choices that would never be diagnosed as eating disorder. You know, like this is commonplace. Like we have like one big, gi if that's how we're defining eating disorders, then we have like one giant, huge, like mass cultural eating disorder on our hands, you know, like, so, um, you know, different women are going to feel different levels of like needing it to pursue help and get help in this and clinical therapy is definitely a huge piece of that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, for sure, I would say the vast majority of women who feel guilty when they eat something quote unquote unhealthy are not being diagnosed as having eating disorders. Mm. So it all kind of like stems back to, well, one, one part of the equation is obviously control, which we talked about. Um, and if the second part is really stemming from weight, like how does body issue fit into all of this, self-esteem, like what does your work do to come from this? Right. I mean, and that's ultimately kind of the bottom. That body image is what distinguishes women who are making healthful choices because they want to treat their bodies well and women who are making healthful choices, in quotes, because they can't stand themselves the way they are, you know, and it's like coming from a place of self-hate versus a place of self-love. Interestingly enough, what I've found and what is kind of part of what I teach is that when we make decisions around food from a place of self-love, when we're making decisions around food from a place of like, I love my body, I want to treat her well, I want to do what's right by her, I want to you know, make the choice that's going to make her feel good, that's a very different motivation than I need to eat this healthy choice because I suck and I have fat thighs and my body's not good enough and I better do this otherwise like all hell's going to break loose. Um, they're just very different, like, attitudes towards health. Um, I would say that the, the, pri the primary, right, the first, the self-love motivation, not only is that more mentally healthy, but it also tends to produce healthier behaviors, right? Like, people who are making healthful choices out of a, from a place of self-love tend to be able to make those choices more sustainably. They tend to not get into on and off the wagon mentality, meaning like, oh, I had a cookie, I might as well eat the whole box. Like that's a self-hating motivation that causes that. Somebody who's coming from a place of self-love will just be like, oh, I ate a cookie, but like, I've had enough. Like, she's good now, you know. So, it's uh, they're just different. They're different motivations, and they have different. The, both of these motivations have different consequences on how we actually behave with food. So a lot of women who are frustrated, like, I know I should be eating this way, but I can't. Chances are their motivations are out of line, right? Like their incentives for eating a certain way are coming from a place of I'm not good enough rather than from a place of I love myself and want to treat myself well. Mm. So how do you bridge the gap? Body image work, man. Like body image work is so critical at every size on the weight spectrum. Like there is no too thin to do body image work. There is no too fat to do body image work. Everyone on everywhere on the weight spectrum needs to come to a place where they respect themselves enough, right, to make choices out of self-love rather than feeling like, oh my god, no, but really I'm fat and I suck and I'm a horrible person and blah, 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 blah. It's like, it doesn't even matter. Like, it does not matter how big or thin you are to, to to be doing this work where you're like, you know what, like, this is my body. This is what it looks like today. I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow. I don't know what it's going to look like next year. I don't know what it's going to look like in 10 years. But today, this is where I'm at, and I'm going to respect myself in the body that I have right now, right? Like, that's where we need to get women. And women are not in that place, right? Like, vast majority of women are like, well, my body sucks right now, but I'm just going to go on this cleanse, and everything's going to be great in the future, which backfires because when we're making choices from this place of not being good enough right now, we fall into this rebellious binge eating, diet binge cycle. So we never end up getting to the place that we think we're going to get, right? Like so many women are never actually ultimately achieving this place of good enough. And, you know, it, it's it's just the cycle. So really the key to changing the mental behaviors and attitudes that will ultimately lead to making the most helpful choices for an individual come from 
doing work, body image work, right? Like come from doing work where you're like, okay, this is where my body is today. Like this is what my body looks like. Like I'm committed to treating her well and loving her no matter what. I'm not going to hide her. I'm not going to shame her. Like I, I'm like cultivating self-respect here regardless of where you're at today as far as size is concerned. Mm -hmm. Is there like one tactic that people could take away? I know the gratitude practice is like really in the wellness zeitgeist now, and I know a lot of people who have begun their own gratitude practices, and that's really helped them. But um, is there something like that in regard to body image that someone could do every day in order to um, take that next step forward? Yeah, there's a few things. I mean, I love the gratitude. Like, I love even just the idea of thinking about your body like a like a human being, which she is. You know, like thinking about your body like like an animal. You know, like would you treat a child or even like a pet? the way you treat your body, you know, like, that's really powerful. Like, really getting in touch with the fact that, like, your body is a human animal. Like, that's what this is. Like, we are mammals, like, walking the earth. Like, and can we start to really look at our bodies like, oh, my gosh, like, this is a living, breathing thing, no different from a child or an animal or whatever. You know, can, can we start treating ourselves that way? You know, I think that that's a big mental shift for people to make is not looking at your body as something that you're supposed to, like, control and contort and force and enslave to do what your mind would have it do, but actually look at your body as, like, a living, breathing organism that needs to be cared for and taken care of, you know? Um, so that's one, you know, on that sort of similar note, uh, you know, like you said, like, I think that the gratitude practices in general, like, thinking about, like, kind of what your body's been through and what it's done for you, you know, is huge. Like, really getting into that sort of mindset of, like, wow, like, my little heart keeps beating, regardless of the fact that I tortured it so much in college with all these crazy binge eating, diet, starvation. I mean, I've, tr I've put my body through such hell, and it just keeps fighting to keep me alive. You know, it, it's, my body's got my back. I should get its back, you know. Um, and then also this is like a big, you know, one of the only sort of clinical evidenced ways of changing people's body image is to actually start surrounding themselves by, with images of people who look like them. Or, uh, yeah, so like, you know, my Instagram feed is like filled up with um, like natural models and like people, there's all sorts of people on the internet who are promoting positive body image. Like the more you can kind of go on a little bit of a media diet, if you will, and sort of really like start to bring images of people of varying different shapes and sizes, like if you start to bring body diversity into your world, right, if you start inviting body diversity into just like, into just your visual world, that actually has been proven to change the way women think about their own bodies. The media is very powerful and it's definitely a really big part of this problem. So there's mm -hmm. all this sort of alternative media coming out with, you know, women of all various different shapes and sizes wearing cool clothes and, you know, having awesome makeup and stuff and, and exposing yourself to those kinds of images is, is very powerful. I love that. Um, okay, well, you've been amazing. We're going to wrap this up, but I have to ask you a question that I ask every single Wellness Wednesday expert. Um, and you may have given your answer already, which is fine. You can elaborate if you want. But um, just back to, you know, all of the confusing information that's out there, if you could tell someone one thing and one thing only to change about their lifestyle that would have just a real general um, benefit to their well-being, what would it be? I would say just be kind to your body. You know, like, just be kind to yourself. Not even just your body. Just be kind to yourself. Like, the more self-compassion I practice, like, the better my life becomes. And I find that in my clients and, and, and just all over the world. I feel like the biggest epidemic, like, we are suffering from in this country and throughout the world is just the epidemic of self-criticism and self-judgment. And, you know if we can just really understand that at any given moment in our life we are doing the best job that we possibly can given the tools and information that we have like really feel compassion for ourselves and for our choices and for our bodies for our minds you know like that's that's it you know like that's that's what's up I love that well thank you Isabel for joining me and for sharing all your wisdom um, definitely go check out Isabel's training series, Stop Fighting Food, really quick, informative videos, um, especially if you've been struggling with some of these issues, as I'm sure many of you have. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. take care. Bye. Bye.